before I properly introduce Dougie, I, I want to really provide some suggestions to our audience. Although we are talking about a very specific application on how a, an oil development has been actually conducted through the concept of a factory type system, a production system, a lot of the, the messages that Doogie from Hess brings to us apply to multiple production systems, right? So I encourage everyone to really listen to Doogie, his story and what he brings to all of us from the perspective of what you do and really have an open mind about how this could apply to other type of production systems. That being said, let me, Dougie, properly introduce you. So bear with me one second. Dougie is actually the vice president of Hess Global Onshore Production Business. In his role, uh, he is responsible for upstream activity related to Hess North Dakota Asset and the company's business operations in Libya as well. Immediately prior to this role, Dougie led the Hess Vacuum Wheel Factory team in North Dakota, which was accountable for reservoir development of Hess acreage. Dougie has 28 years of exploration and production industry experience in technical planning and leadership roles. He has worked in the United Kingdom, Denmark, Malaysia, and the United States. Dougie also led his business activities in West Africa. He began his professional career as a reservoir engineer with Chevron in the United Kingdom and following roles with Edinburgh Petroleum Services and Exxon Mobil as well. He joined Hess in 26, 20, 2006. Dougie, finally, Dougie holds a bachelor degree in chemical engineering from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And he's also a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and an associate member of the Institution of Chemical Engineers. So Dougie, on behalf of PPI, I really want to welcome you and thank for joining us and also for your ongoing not only your personal, but also Hess's involvement in, in the work that the Institute does and for, for several, several years. So with this, it will be over to you. Let me uh, stop sharing my screen. So you please proceed to uh, share your screen. Yeah, let's see if I can, let's see if I can work the technology here. Hopefully okay. we are gonna see a screen come up soon. And if we go yes. into full screen mode, we potentially have success. So that's a good thing. We, we are okay. So one thing before you get going, sorry, Doogie. I just want to encourage our audience to use the question and answer feature, the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions for Doogie, we will dedicate a few minutes after he finishes to, to go through some questions. Over to you, Doogie. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Roberto. Thanks for the kind introduction. And hello, everyone. It's a, you know, it's a real pleasure to get to come and uh, share some of our experience, some of Hess's experience in terms of well delivery with the, with the symposium today. You know, I, you, I, I guess usually you would do acknowledgements at the end, but before I, before I get into anything at all, I really do want to acknowledge Dave McKay, who's, who's very humble about his, his role in setting up really what we're going to be talking about today. And also, you know, I thought it was fantastic to see the recognition for James at the beginning of the meeting, because James has been a real partner for us as, as we've worked through this. And I think the words I, I wrote down were ever patient mentoring. And I think that describes, uh, describes James to a T, frankly, as he's helped us in this journey as we've, we've progressed what we are doing. You know, uh, Roberto shared with you, you know, the, the job that I have now. Previously, I was managing what we call our well factory. So I'm fairly intimate with, with what we're doing uh, for the session. And there's a couple of things I noted down during the earlier remarks as well. I'll try and touch on those as we go. Uh, just if I get the technology working here, let me see if I can do this, I come over here. So uh, you've all seen one of these before, uh, don't buy or sell, has stock based on anything I say today. And this is what we're gonna be covering. So we're gonna try and take a, take a little walk around. We'll take a little look at Hess's back and asset. I think it's important to set context. We've talked about production. We've talked about production systems. What are we actually trying to produce from our well factory? And that feeds into what Dave talked about in terms of 
of wanting to produce oil. And we're going to say we're going to say a bit about that as we go through the presentation, show some results. Uh, we'll talk about what we call lean production control, which is really our production system. And you know, we use some of the, the lean ideas and methodologies to underpin that. We'll look at variability and volatility. There was some discussion around uh, around variability earlier on in the conversation. Some of that happens to us, to us and some of that we choose. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. And then we'll look at some specific areas to hopefully give you some insights, hopefully things that even if you're not in the upstream oil and gas business, as Roberto said, will be will be relevant to you as we work through. And of course, we're, we're very receptive to learning as well. So if, so if, if people are are hearing this discussion and they think about things that would be would be useful to us. We are very receptive to that. I'm not sure I'll be able to track the questions as they come in, but uh, we'll certainly take a look at those as we go. OK, so let me see if we can do this and take my mouse away. So what, what have we got here? What I want to do is just really set up uh, set up the context for what we're what we're trying to do. I think that's quite important when you think about a production system, what we're we actually trying to do. And so on the map on the left, what I'm showing is I'm showing Hess's acreage position in North Dakota. So North Dakota, our Hess back and asset, it's an onshore. Um, for me, I'm going to be talking about the upstream part of our business, onshore upstream oil and gas development and production activity. That's what we have. The dark green rectangles are what we call drill spacing units. So they're the focus of each, of each block of development. We drill wells in our drill spacing units. Light green is, is areas where Hess is an interest, but we don't, we don't operate. And so we're going to focus on our operated business today. And then the, the blue call outs that you see are some of our infrastructure. And of course, our infrastructure is really important to us because that's what we need to get our production to market. Uh, I'll talk about industry volatility a little bit later. But just, you know, just to really highlight how it can affect us right up front, at the bottom of bottom right of this chart, you can see our, our Hess's capital investment into our backing asset. You can see our production profile. So investment, millions of dollars in production, thousands of oil equivalent barrels uh, per day. And you can see we, we were able to grow rapidly from a production perspective. 2017 through 2020, we actually doubled production, which from a base of 100,000 barrels a day is not a not a trivial accomplishment. Of course, we were able to do that because we invested, and you can see that on the, the chart right beside that with our upstream capital investment. And you can see the dramatic change as we went from 2019 through 2020 into 21. And of course, that was driven by the macro conditions that affected the oil and gas business through that period where we had a, a precipitous collapse in oil price. And one of the things that I'll, I'll try and convey today is that we think that our production system keeps us resilient to those changes. Those changes happen, they'll happen again. We're actually in the business of trying to ramp up right now. And, and we need to be able to manage that as we go because we don't control those macro conditions. In terms of what our well factory has delivered so far, we've got around about 1,700 wells that are online today and they get handed from our well factory to our cu customer, which is our operations team. And we've got several thousand more wells to drill and that number will depend on on oil price and how we choose to develop and what our objectives are at any given point in time. But you know, if you think about what we talked about early in the meeting around construction, driving capital efficient investment, we certainly want that too. And so that's that's you know, along with the uh, along with lean systems, that's the tools and systems that we've we've chosen to focus on. We're going to keep investing in this asset. So even although we have some of the volatility that I've described, we're going to keep investing and therefore we've got We've got an absolute passion for scalable, repeatable, standardized processes. There was some words used earlier, automation, digitization, standardization. You know, I had the, the little roadmap, I think most of us here will recognize that we've either been on that or we are on that. But all of those are important to us. They are definitely going to be what's happening as we go forward. And I thought it was, you know, it was quite interesting that in Todd's, uh, Todd's remarks, he used the little picture that we have at the bottom here of this presentation and what, you know, what do I really want to say about that? Well, you, we, we think about it this way, you know, we think about it this way in the sense that we've got our product design, which for the well factory is, is wells and the facilities that we want to build. We've got our process design, we're gonna talk about that today. Capacity we can think on in the context of drilling rigs or frack crews. Uh, we'll, we'll not talk too much about inventory today, but it's something we keep a real eye on. And then we will spend quite a bit of time talking about variability and how we manage that. And of course, as I described before I hit the button there, you know, the, the cash that we're willing to put in 
is one of the major things that affects us here. So this is, I think, quite appropriate. It's quite good that we had this, this diagram in here to, to help us with our conversation. On the next slide, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more about the strategies that underpin our asset, and I'll get in, start to get into our well factory, what we call our well factory approach to development. So what have we got, what have we got here? Well, what I want to, you know, again, just, just setting things up, what I want to start with is, you know, what are we actually trying to do? And we, we want to deliver value. So that might not be too abstract a concept, but it's quite a broad statement, of course. What, is, what does that really mean? Everyone, I'm, I'm sure, thinks we're, we're delivering value. Well, for us, we're trying to operate for the long term. We think about NPV. We're not trying to develop our asset and sell it. We think about our development in the context of operating it for 10, 20, 30, perhaps 40 years into the future. So that's really important. You know, having decided what we want, we've then got to decide how we're going to get there. And so if I look at the diagram on the left here, and we think about development philosophy. We, we want to understand the subsurface. That's critical. For an upstream oil and gas development, the geology is very, very important. It's a source of variability, and it's an area where we want to and we need to learn more. We then move down here, operational performance. So we want to execute efficiently. You know, We want to reduce costs. We want to reduce variability, which is actually quite important to us because it gives us predictability of outcomes, and that helps our company represent high confidence delivery to our stakeholders in the market. Uh, you notice the comment on reducing emissions. I'll say a little bit about that as we go and improving ESG performance has been mentioned. It's clearly a priority across all industries. We need an export strategy. We have to get our, our product to sales and that's important. And of course, we try and manage our acreage position. I'm not going to say too much about the left-hand side of this chart uh, as we go through our presentation. If I now turn, turn to our well factory on the right-hand side, and here we we do think about this as a manufacturing approach to delivering wells and pads all the way through to handover to customer, which is our operations team. So our handover point sits right around here and we have to go through all of these parts of the process. We use a last planner system, which was described and we've got that, I think, at the appropriate level in the field. So, for example, the drilling supervisor who's on the drilling rig is accepting the production plan for the next shift, understanding what's happened in the previous shift. We've worked hard to cultivate a lean mindset, making problems visible, using structured problem solving to fix them, trying to standardize what we do and, and, and then improve upon the standard, of course. And, uh, you know, it's a really, you know, one thing that's interesting for us, we've, we've tried to ramp up our technology application over the last several years. And we've done that because we think it will drive improvement. But of course, it's a source of vari variability. So we need to be able to do that in a, in a very managed way. And when you've got a stable production system, and you've got, you've got consistent results. You've actually got quite a good platform for trying things and understanding the results that you're getting and understanding if you like what you've tried and you then want to repeat it. A leadership approach is, is really, really important. We try and, you know, I'm saying what we want to do. I'm not saying we always manage to do this, but we want to cultivate an approach of servant leadership where the most important people are the people in the field who are actually executing the work. And it's been mentioned a few times integrated relationships between operators and suppliers are where we are spending a lot of time. We've, in many areas, we've absolutely moved away from three bids and a buy. We're wanting to really cultivate those relationships, relational contracting is not precisely the term that we're using, but I can absolutely understand what was being mentioned there. And before, you know, moving off this slide, I do want to call, it's actually a call out of an important point, a call out for the Project Production Institute. But there was work that was done in 2019 looking at the upstream business. And this is the call out at the top of this slide. And what the work identified was that there was 20 at the time, $26 billion of capital that was tied up in drilled but uncompleted wells. Now, that's Hess has never been one of the companies that, that has looked to build up backlogs of drilled but uncompleted wells or ducks. But there was that work estimated about $26 billion tied up. And for the North American upstream business, it suggested around about 12 billion of that could be unlocked simply by uh, optimizing the well production system, reducing variability and getting to more consistent results of what was coming off the production line. So I think that's, I think that's quite important. Next up, you know, if a picture, if a picture tells a thousand words, I kind of wanted to, to give a little visual because I think it's nice to have the, the, the pretty graphs and so forth, but I think it's even nicer to visualize what we're actually talking about. And, you know, from the point of view, we've got quite a lot of activity in this example that I'm showing. Uh, 
you know, what we've got here is we've got a well pad. Uh, in the background, you can see the, the trucks and equipment associated with frack activity. So there's fracturing going on on this well pad. There's some wells have, have just recently been drilled. In the foreground, you can see our well pad process facilities. So you can see small facilities and tanks for storage, other equipment. I'm going to guess that there's uh, some construction ongoing. I, you, you can't quite pick that out in the visual. Uh, if some of you think this is how every day is in North Dakota, it's not always quite as nice as this. This is perhaps one of the, the nicer days that we could have picked. And, you know, you think then about the confidence that a well-managed production system can give you. And Dave McKay actually referenced this. As far as executing on a well pad, we, we would, I don't want to reach too far, but we're definitely trying to stay away from chaos because as we get closer and closer to, closer and closer to the chaos that Dave provided, you get closer and closer to EHS incidents, people getting hurt and things happening in your business that you don't want, lack of predictability, et cetera. We think what we do helps us manage this. And one, one of the things, if you look at this and if you're in the upstream business, you might be saying, oh, that's a big pad and it is. And we look at this type of a display and we think, how can we do it better? How can we get the same amount of wells with smaller facilities? How can we get the same amount of production with less wells? And how can we do what we do in less time and so forth. And how can we make that something that's advantageous, not just for Hess, but also for our suppliers? Because there's a sort of dilemma there for our suppliers, the faster and better they do work, they could be working themselves out of jobs and so forth. That's a, that's a tricky one for us to manage. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about, you know, the processes that underpin our well factory execution. So I'll just change to that slide now and we're, we're kind of back to the PowerPoint, probably, prefer the, the, the previous one. But what we're showing here is we're showing that value stream at the start again. We're showing that point of handover to our customer, our operations team. And we're showing, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to the drilling rig because we've chosen to manage our value stream around the drilling rig and around that initial production commitment of wells coming off the production line or wells online. We do that because we don't want the drilling rig to be idle. It's costly and it's a very visible element of the process. And that means we need to have appropriate buffers in our system upstream of the drilling rig. We also need to have wells coming off the production line at the rate that we require to deliver our production commitments. And we've heard some comments on that earlier in the panel discussion as well. I want to show a little bit more about wells online later because that's an important measure for us. If you think about, you know, what might be appropriate buffers for us, you know, you might be thinking about things like, you know, we heard the, heard, heard the discussion of doing business in Kazakhstan in the winter. Well, you know, the winters in North Dakota can be pretty harsh as well. So we've absolutely got to manage, you know, how we do things. And we choose not to build well pads in the depth of winter. We don't want to do that. Then you think about some other uncer uncertainties that we might face, political uncertainty, for example, and, and to manage the uncertainty associated with the, the US election in 2020, we built up a buffer of permits ahead of the drilling rig to make sure that we could keep working until we understood what was going to change, if anything. At each handoff in this process, we've got the fine conditions of satisfaction. So one of the more obvious ones would be as we hand over to operations, there's a certain amount of uh, sand in the production stream that's acceptable to us. So that's quite important. And on the bottom right, what I really want to highlight is we've got, we've got a rigorous operating rhythm and we do notice, and you know, we're we're failed creatures like everyone. So we sometimes, we sometimes don't manage things as rigorously as we should, and then we reinstill the discipline because we do see that when we step away from that daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and also really annual operating rhythm, we start to see that things drift if we don't have those daily meetings, if we don't have those weekly meetings, if we don't talk about problems and how to fix them. So we're pretty militant about trying to keep that in line. We manage, uh, we manage our value stream. We happen to use SPS software. We work, work very closely with James and the SPS team, and they've played a large part in establishing these systems, but it's the system that's really important for us here. And then if you look at the bottom left, you see you know, what, what one of the things that we covered, which is you know, improvement. We're showing drilling cycle time here, but it's not just the improvement. And this is days, and we've taken the scale off because it's really the point of reducing cycle time, but very importantly on this plot, the, the, the extended bars that you see each year are representing variability. So we're not only reducing cycle times, but we're reducing variability. And that's really, really important for us. Last point I want to make on this particular slide, I think is important, and that's suppliers. They are fully integrated into this process. 
they have to work with us in this process and it can cause a point of stress because Hess is by, by no means the biggest client that the, the companies we work with are working with and we are saying we want to work in a certain way and we make it a condition of employment with us, condition of working with us and our suppliers are actually happy to, to adopt that because I think they're seeing some advantages for them that they can take to other customers and potentially get some wins in their own business. But that's a, that's a really important point. I'm just going to I'm going to go relatively quickly because I know that we've got limited time. We want to make sure there's time for for discussion. But next, I want to touch on volatility. On the top left of this, what you can see is you can see the black line is oil price, and the scale doesn't really do the volatility justice. But you can see what's occurred in our industry. You know, the sort of early part of the 2010s, it was relatively stable. Then we had a big drop in 2014 further relative stability and then 2020 was quite chaotic again and you can see activity tracking that but the reason activity in general as expressed by rig count is dropping is because hes other companies are getting more efficient we are learning we are getting better at how we execute our business uh, if we go to the right hand side of this this is really how hes has responded to this so first quarter of 2020 we had six drilling rigs operating three frack crews and by the time we got to the end of 2020, we had really reduced our activity. Everyone else had done the same thing. But there's an important point here, for us at least, we hadn't reduced it to zero. We had kept a drilling rig operating. We kept frack work operating. That was really important in terms of retaining capability and retaining you know, these processes. It might have been a little bit harder from a knowledge retention perspective. So that continuity, we think, is helpful to us. The point here about going to half a frack crew is quite interesting. Because what that means is, it means that our supplier of frack crews has now got half a frack crew they have to manage. That gives us a further source of variability because they need to work that with other customers if they can, because they can't leave equipment lying idle so that we can get access to it. And that's something that our processes help us take account of. And that's where good relationship with your suppliers, that's an example of where it becomes very important because you start to get more confidence that you're going to get the equipment that you want when you need it without having to pay for it, being on standby all the time. When I talk about variability through choice, and I think this is very important as well, I, I described some of the improvements that we've seen, and, and some of those improvements have come because of technology application and other things that we've tried and that have worked. You know, tr try something, it works, keep trying it. Try something that doesn't work, reject it, move on to something else. And so that variability, we've got to accommodate what we want to do. We've also got to think about that geology changing. And what I'm showing on the top left is, we are moving into different parts of the play. The reservoir quality changes, and we've got to be able to account for that. Then when you think about well design, what does that mean? So I've got that with our optimizing value levers. We try and maximize our DSU value through a combination of well spacing and completion design. And it's not going to be the same for each DSU. We have to be resilient to those changes as well. We have to be able to accommodate those because we want to do it. We choose to do that. On the bottom left, really just to whet the appetite of upstream folks in the audience, we want to experiment to understand how to do things better. In this particular example, we took a DSU and we put a well in the ground that we don't produce, but we've instrumented that well with fibre, with pressure gauges, with all kinds of other measurements. We've tried different completion designs. We've got very tactile information now that's going to help us manage and, and optimise going forward. But of course, that means change. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we chose to make in recent years was a, a, a fairly big change in completion style. We went from a style called sliding sleeves to a style called plug in perf. We were able to accommodate that, and I'll show you the results of that as we get to the end of the presentation. And so we have multiple changes. We've got one production line. We think we can accommodate that, and we can only really do it because of, I think, how we operate. And again, I'll call out this uh, collaboration with fewer suppliers. We've moved away from some of the other ideas you'll hear about, like managed competition, one drilling rig supplier, one completions uh, supplier, and so forth, trying to pick companies who are the best at what they do. Again, some further pictures of seeing this in action and just trying to illustrate, if you've got some memory of the previous slide, you saw a very different production facility from what we're showing here. This is what we call our, our bulk and test facility that we're now applying, where we can apply that. And down here, what you can see is a, a, a term, again, for those of you in the upstream business, simulfrac or simultaneous fracturing operations. 
Here we're working on four wells at once. We've effectively got two frack crews on the site at once. And that's different from what we showed in the earlier design. And we can really do that because of the systems and processes that we've set up. They enable us to accommodate these changes, manage that variation and help us go forward. I am going to say right now, we're absolutely not where we want to be. We know that there's further improvements ahead of us. And this doesn't all just happen seamlessly, but when we look at it in aggregate, it does come together quite well for us. And just to hopefully not belabor that point as I come through you kind of towards the, the results that you'll see. We, we, our project controls are really some of the traditional project controls that you think about in terms of annual business cycle, well AFEs, et cetera. So we do have those controls in place. We do have production scheduling in place, which again, we use the, we have to use SPS to help us with that, but it's underpinned by operation science, helping us understand, you know, what, uh, what buffers do we need? What's the appropriate uh, level of whip that we should have and so forth to try and make sure that what comes off the back of the production line happens the way that we want it to. Uh, recognizing a little bit tight for time, I'll maybe just call your attention to the bottom right here, you know, just highlight one of the issues that, that we had as we were changing what we were doing, our sand supplier. So as we hydraulically fracture these wells, we'll pump anything between five and 15 million pounds of sand into each well. And our uh, sand supplier saying, look, we, we, we're struggling with your demand changing. How can you help us? Well, we help them by integrating them directly into the process and they can see what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, which helps us manage our business better. Helps them manage, helps us manage. Some results now. I'm going to go to Wells Online. So I've called that out a couple of times. What we have on the top left here, 2012, the green line is what was delivered, around about 150 wells delivered in 2012. Uh, the yellow line is what was promised to the company, well in excess of 200 wells. This is the, some of the chaos that Dave was describing earlier. So Dave and, and a number of other people that Dave called out got to work on this. And in 2018, so a pretty stable year. We've got a relatively nice overlay, around about 105 wells targeted, 105 wells delivered in reasonable conformity. 2020, very disrupted year. You can see we had a portion here where we drifted. Uh, we changed our business model that year. We had to reduce risks. But overall, against our revised plan, we got to about the right place. So we've got that surety of delivery. What about quality? What we're showing here is the oil delivered by each well over around about the first year of production. And it's just a step through time, 2015 through to 2019, which is the last year we're showing for one of our field areas. And you can see we were delivering improvement in well productivity and we were delivering the quality of well that we wanted. I'll wrap up in just a moment, Roberto. Great. Repeat the cycle time improvements here. So this is this is what we've seen. Other companies have done some of this as well, but we like the, the, the variability. This is cost now. This is that change that you see as we moved from improving our sliding sleeve design. There was the comment earlier, nothing worse than getting really efficient with something that you shouldn't be doing. Recognizing a change was appropriate to deliver higher value and then going through and doing exactly the same thing again. Here, we were not competitive with the best in industry for plug-in perf. Here we are, we've managed to do it in a relatively short period of time. So we're, we're pleased with that, we're not satisfied. And then this, I think something that we don't talk about an awful lot, but this is Hess's environmental performance expressed through LOPCs, loss of primary containments, barrels of liquid spell, uh, spilled per million barrel produced. And, and we're sitting in a decent place and again, decent repeatability between years. So we're sat, you know, we, we like those results. We want more of that happening. and and. I think I've covered the majority of these remarks as I've as I've talked. So, you know, just to reiterate, we like the reliability. The embedment is critical and it's all stakeholders. We don't perfectly manage variability and volatility. It can be a bit of a nightmare at times. We definitely have issues. We definitely have problems. We definitely have improvement opportunities ahead of us. And, you know, a huge number, there's a number of people in this call, Dave in particular, James and others have helped to support us as we've got to where we've got to. And we're just so enthusiastic about what's ahead of us, right? There's more to come. This is, this, is just the, this is just the start. There's more to come. That was what I had today. Excellent. Doogie, thank you so much. Very, honestly, very impressive results. And it's also the journey you guys went through, right? Over the years, right? 
uh, what you just recently show in 20, 2012, that things were not necessarily going as you wanted with less throughput than, than your target, right? And so we have time for probably a couple of questions for you. And let me start with, with this question. So the journey that has actually have gone through over the years, how much of that journey do you think has been driven by, by this relentless focus on performance? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, if we go back to, maybe go back, I've been with Hess since 2006. Now I think I've seen an acceleration in drive for performance over time. And so the relentless drive for performance, I think has been critical. I think we talked about C-suite support and we'll use Dave as the C-suite. Dave was the, the, the executive leader for the asset who was saying, this is how we're going to work. I think there was also recognition, Roberto, and, and it, not by everybody, I'm going to say this, not by everybody in the team and perhaps still not by everybody in the team, but there was recognition within the team that there was a real learning opportunity here. I think the way that it was set up, it actually provided some enormous career development for people to develop new skills and show that they could, they could adapt and adopt these new ideas to deliver better, you know, superior results. It frustrates the devil out of me when I see, and, and the, the, the US onshore business is incredibly transparent. So it frustrates the devil out of me when I see other companies de de delivering better results, which they do sometimes than Hess, but it just encourages us to redouble our efforts. We think we're on the right path. We think we've got sustainability as well. You know, we think we, we see other companies' results sometimes fluctuate, but we've got that, that track record that I showed. So, you know, it is, it is a pretty relentless drive, but I think there's also a big people development component. I think the the, the, the lean strand to this in terms of structure, problem solving, managing our value stream, managing our processes is, is quite attractive for some people, but it's not attractive for others. The, 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 perhaps the challenge that we've had in recent years has been how we've successfully and sometimes not successfully implemented technology and innovation into what we're doing. The, the, this idea of a standard process is the standard for improvement versus the standard forever is really important. Excellent. Thank you so much for your insights. We do have another question that comes from an, another oil and gas company. The comment is, thanks for a great success story. Congratulations. They're saying to you. And the question is, by adopting operation science as an enabler, can you share a little bit of the relative size of the value from HES perspective in terms of cost, schedule, and cash? In, in related, uh, related to working capital. So, yeah, I'll, uh, 20, uh, I'll, yeah, absolutely share some of that. 2012 was a, a really, it's, it's, chosen, it's chosen well. Thank you for the question. It's chosen well. It was a difficult year for Hess. We had a big cost overrun in back and we had big cost overruns in other, in other assets. And it really, the, the case for change sort of wrote itself that year. Uh, and as, as, as I mentioned, we didn't get wells off the production line the way that we wanted to. Over the past, you know, four or five years, we've successfully met our production commitment to our stockholders and we've met our capital commitment to our stockholders as well. So we've managed to meet our commitments. We've got some predictability there. You know, I, I probably would struggle to say to you, look, you know, we're delivering wells for six million now. Without this, it would be six and a half million or so forth. What I can say is if we were delivering wells at the median of competition, it would probably be you know, a few hundred thousand more per well because we are, we are at the, the better end, not necessarily the cheapest, but that of course assumes you want to be the cheapest. And we want these wells to work for 30 or 40 years into the future. And some other companies might have a little bit of a different business model. You actually do get most of the value in the first 10 years of production life of the well, but we think we're going to be operating for a long time. So cheapest might not be the only metric. I'll give you one other metric that could be helpful to you. When the downturn hit, and we went from six rigs down to one rig. We were effectively able to do that, and, and we kept our comp completion crews operating. We didn't build up any drilled but uncompleted wells. We are, we, I showed at the start, non-operated in interests. We participate in another, a number of companies' wells, and I can say that there's one other organization in North Dakota, I wouldn't say who. We've got over $20 million of capital tied up in ducks with that company. And we don't know when we're going to get the production. And so that's material. 
$20 million. If you lost that, you'd be very, very annoyed. So, you know, these are, and, and that may be a choice. I'm not saying that that's not the right business decision for that company, but it's not what we would choose to do. That might well be the right business decision for that company, but it's not what we would choose to do because we don't want that money lying idle. We don't think we can predict oil price. If we did, we would be doing a different thing. So as we execute, we want to bring the production online and we've got some marketing capability that helps us. So for example, Hess, during the depth of the downturn, sent oil to VLCCs and we were able to send those to Asian markets uh, where the, the crude was sold around the end of this year rather than the depths of the cycle. So um, like I say, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that other company because I think they've made a bad business decision. They might have made absolutely the right decision for them, but it's not what we would choose to do. And we think our system helps us manage that. Excellent, Dougie. Thank you so much for your participation. We run out of time. And so on behalf of PPI, once again, thanks to you and Hess for being really open and sure we're yeah. achieving and how you are doing it. I think your comments about production systems and, and how you strategically use buffers and variability through choice and, and how you're integrating your suppliers because the production system, the world factory is yours, right? You, you are yeah. the owner operator that integrates all the work. And, and, and also the, the point you made at the end before you start showing the results on the difference between controls and control and, and how you consciously and strategically differentiate them both and use them both. So thank you so much for your participation, Doogie. We will move to the next uh, session. Excellent. Have an excellent day. Thank you. Thank you.